welcome to Culture Vultures. I'm Sandy Fry, your host. Our creative producer is Nancy Cole. And this is a program that examines culture and the arts in the Tampa Bay area. Our guest today is author and historian Doris Weatherford, who in the 1980s began an examination of the challenges and the achievements of women in America, whether they were newly arrived immigrants, suffragists, workers in World War II industries, and she culminated it by no means the final production, but she culminated that work in a four-volume book of history of women in the United States, state by state. I'll give you a title rundown. First, Foreign and Female, Emigrant Women in America. This was published in 1986. American Women and World War II was published in 1990, and both won good reviews. American Women's History was published in 1994, followed by Milestones, a chronology of American women's history. That came three years later. And more recently was the four-volume History of Women in the United States, State by State, a reference. Closer to home, Doris wrote the comprehensive Real Women, a historical review of the roles women played in the development of Tampa and environs from prehistory to the millennium. This was published by the University of Tampa Press in 2005. And that's not all. As a resident of Tampa and Hillsborough County, she's taught at USF, has chaired the Florida Women's Hall of Fame, has managed political campaigns and very adroitly, and is a recipient of grants from the Florida Humanities Council, among others. So it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. It makes me tired just listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact that you're able to do that in what looks like maybe a decade and a couple of years is very impressive. Yeah. No, it's longer than that, actually. <laughs> well, it, well, in Gail Collins' book, she sort of cites the 1960s as the time that real change came, mm -hmm. and she kind of uh, titles it or book uh, no, notes it by saying that's when uh, employment advertisements was help wanted male, mm -hmm. help wanted female. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. see that anymore. Mm -hmm. And I bet if women mm -hmm. <laughs> were to see it today, yep. they would be very sore indeed. Yep. But when you were an undergraduate, did you intend to follow women's accomplishments and challenges? I intended to be a historian. I didn't have any idea about women's history. And actually, the way that it happened was uh, I was teaching in Massachusetts, teaching high school American history. Uh, I had dropped out of graduate school to support us while my husband finished his PhD at Harvard. And I could get a raise at my high school if I took one more class, uh, one more graduate level class. Mm -hmm. So I enrolled in summer school at Harvard and took a course on immigration. And obviously, the person who taught it was one of the great historians of immigration in the world. And I realized after a while that he just wasn't paying any attention to the women at all. And in fact, one day he made the positive statement that women were more likely to not assimilate, to want to go home, to, to be lonely and isolated. And I said, well, what about people like my Norwegian and German grandmothers who got jobs in American homes out in the Midwest? Wouldn't they learn the language faster? Wouldn't they learn what Americans wore, what they ate? Wouldn't they assimilate far faster than, say, an Irishman who's working on the railroads with other Irishmen or a Slavic man who's working in the steel mills with other Slavic men? And he looked like, at me like I was nuts, that the thought had never crossed his mind. Uh, he also stated that, that men were more likely to go back home than women, and I, I asked him for some data to back that up, and never had occurred to him that anybody would question him, let alone this young, impolitic student. Uh, so I went over to the Widener Library, which is the biggest library in the world, except for the Library of Congress, to check out a simple book on immigrant women, and there wasn't any. There were monographs on Italian women in industry or British women uh, on the plains and that sort of thing. So I set out to write an easy to read 
fun, interesting examination of the experience of immigrant women. Wow. That brings up a very good point. I, a friend of mine taught sources, finding sources in the journalism sequence at uh, Florida University. And it, uh, was, it was really meant to equip any aspiring journalist to have a list of places where you could find out anything about anybody mm -hmm. who lived in a certain city from the mm -hmm. following. But that doesn't apply, and I bet it doesn't apply to a whole most women mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the earliest days mm -hmm. on. Yep. What did you do to it, find it, the sources? It's, it's still very frustrating. My second book on women during World War II, uh, it had been out for years when we went into the Gulf War. And it began with a chapter on some 500 American women who were prisoners of war in the South Pacific from the beginning of World War II to at the end. and. Uh, Yet here were journalists on television saying, oh, gee, we have women in combat in the Persian Gulf. We might have women who are prisoners of war, completely ignoring the experience of a generation earlier. Uh, it's almost as though if it happens to women, it doesn't happen. It's getting better, but it's very slow. And way too many historians, both men and women, still seem to assume that women belong in the footnotes. Uh, Ken Burns, for example, with his amazing success on the Civil War, included just a couple of well-known women in minor roles. There are dozens, dozens of women who left their memoirs of the Civil War. It could have been so much richer than, than what he has done. Uh, we're still relegated to the footnotes. We, they, men and, and too many women mm -hmm. still don't go to the resources that are there to figure out what would enrich their topic. Yeah. Um, well, immigrant women uh, are probably harder to find these days because I think you're talking about the first waves yes. up yes. to maybe World yes. War II. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I, uh, I just published a book with Congressional Quarterly Press. I have a contract now with um, UF for a history of Florida women. Ah. And when I finish that contract, I am going to retire in the sense of not having any more contracts. Uh, I don't want any more deadlines. But I may very well go back to my original heart topic of immigrant women and pick up where it left off. Uh, it, the first book left off in the 1920s when mm -hmm. uh, we passed a quota act in 1924 that very much changed the nature of immigration. So I'd like to, I'm thinking about a chapter in the 30s uh, when there were actually few, more people who left the United States than came in. Interesting. Uh, yes. So the, the Great Depression. And during the Great which Depression. Which gave rise to the right. Great Migration. Right, right. Yeah. And, and then we didn't let them in either. Uh, at the end of the 1930s, tragic, tragic stories of Jews and other persecuted groups who were trying to get in and couldn't. And then after World War II, we had a different kind of immigrant in terms of war brides uh -huh. and displaced persons. Uh, in the 50s, we had another communist scare and cut back on immigration. Then Lyndon Johnson uh, reformed the law again in 1965 to encourage immigrants who could bring certain skills and, and money to the U.S. And that changed the nature again with a lot more Asians, some more Africans. Um, Vietnam War in the 70s brought another kind of immigrant. And now, of course, we have Mexico and Latin America and Haiti and, and Cuba uh, and, and differential uh, policies. Right. And different policies and the Cubans back in the 60s and, mm -hmm. and, and some Cubans now and treated differently from um, other Others. ethnic groups. Yeah. So I think uh, it would be a, an interesting book. The, the temptation always is to get into too much detail on one of them, but I'd like to see a broad overview of today's immigrants, who they are and how they got here. Right. Well, when you were doing the immigrant women, there were still a few people whose recollections you had access to. How mm -hmm. did you find them? I didn't use much oral history. 
because uh, women's history is still so suspect from a lot of points of view that I want everything to be documented. Um, and I use lots and about half social worker records and about half uh, memoirs of immigrant women that had been translated into English. And there were more of those than you might expect, especially among Jewish women uh, and Norwegian women. I had a surprisingly hard time finding things from German women that had been translated. Uh, I think at both wars, having been fought against Germany, they, yeah. the, the heritage societies weren't there. But um, I, I do very little oral history. I, I get into it because people want to tell me about their grandmothers, and, and I want to hear it. Uh, and my mother's favorite book of mine was the immigrant book because she could remember um, not her own case but her mother's case and uh, people she grew up with sure but uh, I, I, I try to avoid oral history partly because there again is a real difference between men and women if you ask a man what he did in World War II you usually get the Archie Bunker kind of response if you know I have won it all by myself. <laughs> uh, and if you ask a woman what she did in World War II, oh, really nothing. I remember one example here in Tampa uh, when I, I was working on the revision of the immigrant book. And uh, I, I asked her about her life. And she said, well, Sam and I had a store in Ybor City. And, and I was there. I got there about 7 every morning. And I usually stayed until about 9 every night. But no, I never worked. Sam made the living. Yes, got that. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, well, how about women in the war industries? Were they a little bit more forthcoming, if you did speak to any? Yes, uh, I've done two books on that. The mm -hmm. first one was narrative style. The second one, the publisher wanted an A to Z style. So I did um, about 400 A to Z entries, both on, on topics and on individuals. And I think the biggest untold story of World War II is the political story. Uh, everybody knows about Rosie the Riveter. People increasingly know about the Wax and the Waves and the other women who joined the military. Uh, and they know about rationing and volunteerism and the Red Cross and that sort of thing. What they don't know is that there were powerful women in Congress during that era. There was a woman who chaired the House Labor Committee. You know, labor is key to winning the war. A woman chaired the uh, House Veterans Committee when the GI Bill was passed. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet people don't know of these women. You say Edith Norris Rogers or, or Mary Teresa Norton, and you get blank looks from everybody. And again, you have to wonder how much it is because they were women. Uh, they were doing things in the 40s that women weren't supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And in the 50s, we did go backwards. We, we definitely went backwards in the 50s. And by the time the 60s came around, they were forgotten. Uh huh. Uh, I, I'm sure they didn't go willingly in many, many cases. Some, Margaret Chase Smith, people know her name still. Yeah. Uh, uh, so some were self-promoting enough mm -hmm. that uh, that they, but these women had long careers. They served in Congress. Uh, Edith North Rogers served longer than any other person, I believe, or any other woman. I believe it was 45 years, a very long time. Well, and, that, that, let me just ask you, and uh -huh. it just is interesting. What what year has seen the most women in Congress? Uh, the, um, we're slowly getting in there now for the Senate and for governors. Um, the biggest change, of course, was in the 70s. Oh. There's no decade like the 70s. Uh, everything came alive with Betty Friedan's book and Gloria Steinem's book and the formation of now. And um, uh, you mentioned advertising yes. a, a little while ago. Our now chapter in Tampa formed in um, May of 1972. I moved here in August of 72. And uh, one of the things we achieved was getting the newspapers to declassify ads. Yes. It's 
by sales professional <laughs> whatever instead of help wanted men and help wanted women and and that's huge it is huge it certainly is uh, we got the first women television anchors um, Leslie Chazelle and Sarah Golenvo and that was only after Lita Caesar went down and applied for a job at Channel 13 and they didn't hire her and she sued and um, it opened uh, things up. <laughs> we had a, a, an out-of-court settlement and I chaired the committee that oversaw the enforcement of the settlement and I think it, it impressed the the male executives that I chaired a committee uh, a meeting of that committee mm -hmm. uh, that adjourned at five o'clock and my baby was born at three o'clock the next morning. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have a wonderful deadline talent. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> well, was that during the time or slightly before you uh, you headed the uh, Women's Hall of Fame in Florida? That was much later. Yeah. Actually, the story of the Florida Women's Hall of Fame uh, began with Bob Graham in the 1980s. Ah. The Florida Commission on the Women of uh, Florida Commission on the Status of Women began even earlier under Ferris Bryant in the 1960s when John Kennedy was president and he asked every governor to create a Status of Women Commission uh, and Bryant did and I'm only now in writing this book for the University of Florida uh, rediscovering that history. Mm -hmm. It was ephemeral, was lost and um, and uh, I'm finding the old newspapers and the sources on that commission. But it basically went out of existence uh, in the late 80s. And then Lawton Childs campaigned, partly at my instigation and, and Marsha Mann and some other troublemakers. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we got Lawton to campaign, campaign on restoring the commission on the status of women mm -hmm. and making the Women's Hall of Fame a permanent entity sure. in the law with the plaques displayed in the Capitol and guidelines of, of how you are chosen and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I chaired that during the years oh. of Lawton's administration. Right. Well, if you're digging into the history of Florida, you must have been digging into 49 or 50 other histories for oh, yeah. the state by state. Yeah. Now, <laughs> what organizations were helpful in that? Would it be the community organizations? Or the USF that? Library is more helpful than anything. Is that right? And, and I honor the memory of Mary Lou Harkness yes. every chance I get. Yeah. Actually, I shouldn't say memory. She's still with us. Right. But uh, Mary Lou did an incredible job of mm -hmm. building that library from nothing. Uh, we have wonderful resources there. And I basically sat down at the computer and, and looked at the books on Minnesota and then went to the library and checked out three dozen books on Minnesota, <laughs> went through the indexes looking for women's names. I already knew quite a bit of this from having done a history of the vote. So I knew who the leaders were in each state for the vote. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the state encyclopedia goes from prehistory to modern times. So uh, that's right. I, 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 the thing that I learned most about was native tribes, and um, how women's role in different tribes varies, yeah. and uh, and some of them were very powerful. Well, we had our own Pocahontas, did we? Yes, not? we did. We did. And uh -huh. Eulalia? Eulalia. Uh, um, what part did she play? Did she, she save anybody? She, she predates <laughs> Pocahontas by a good century. And everywhere you find these situations where um, an Indian woman saves an English man or a Spanish man or whatever. Because in most tribes, women had the power to decide whether a prisoner of war would live or die. Ah. Uh, Interesting. The, yeah. It was going to be women who took care of these prisoners of war, who fed them, um, kept them under Life. control. When the, you know, when the men went out on their hunting expeditions, the prisoners were going to stay with the women in the camps. And so uh, men had a real incentive to get along with these women. They figured it out pretty quickly that they, they wanted to get along with them. And Eulalia saved the life twice of a man named uh, Juan Ortiz. And then uh, when another expedition came through, he betrayed her and joined back up with the Spanish. And um, uh, that happened 
to others too who are less well known. Other Pope, women you're talking mm -hmm. about who were Pocahontas able to, right. did all right. You know, mm -hmm. she actually died in England. And, really? And, yes, uh, uh, she went to England. She changed her name to Rebecca Wolf when she married and was baptized. And she went to England to visit her husband's family. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a baby, Thomas, and uh, they were on their way back to the, uh, I started to say the U.S., on their way back to Virginia to, uh, and she became ill. And the ship actually turned around, went back up the, the Thames, and mm -hmm. she died and is buried at Gravesend uh, outside of London. And, and yet you have people who think that because Disney did what they did, yes. Pocahontas is a myth. But in fact, there were Pocahontases all over the country. Very interesting. That's mm -hmm. very interesting. Um, I think it's Wyoming, which, which first state to grant women's mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. Are there, in your researches, two questions really, are there states whose women sort of come out at you as very effective? Mm -hmm. And the second is, what is the difference between the way men define women and women define women? All right, I'm going to tackle the first one first, and you'll have okay. to remind me the second one. <laughs> uh, there are huge differences between states, huge. In fact, the way I would like to see teachers teach history is to explain that feminist evolution has been largely a fight between women's rights and so-called states' rights. We all recognize states' rights as a code word that held down blacks, but we don't think about it in terms of women, and it's still true. Mm -hmm. Your rights, your reproductive rights, vary when you yeah. cross state lines right now. Mm -hmm. And all of American history should be seen through this lens of the United States were not united. Women's status was very, very different. As you said, Wyoming got the vote uh, in 1869, wow. uh, very soon after the first call for the vote in 1848. And it was because they, they were very open about it. The men wanted women to move there. The ratio of, of men to women was about 20 to 1. And, um, uh, so they had ulterior they, motives. Yeah, yes, they wanted women to move there. <laughs> yeah. And the same was true in, in several western states right. where uh, they passed equal pay laws even, saying oh, really? we, we, we really want you to come west and uh, we're going to reward you for that. Mm -hmm. It got complicated because of Mormonism. Uh, Utah granted women the vote in January of 1870, just a few weeks after Wyoming in December 1869, and in Utah there was a different kind of ulterior motive. Uh, the, the Mormon men were afraid that Gentile men were going to begin to outvote them, and so they granted the vote to their women because with multiple wives they sure. would have multiple votes. Uh, and this became a real issue in Washington and a real discouragement for, for the national movement. Uh, Utah women voted for something like 17, 19 years, and then they lost the vote. Congress took it away from them in um, uh, Edmunds Tucker Act. Uh, really? Took it away. And when they came back into the... to, to join the nation and not be a territory anymore but be a state, uh, they uh, they came in without the vote, but then the next year, women women yeah. got the vote yeah. again. Uh, and same thing happened in Washington State, where the legislature had granted women the vote. The Washington mm -hmm. Supreme Court, on a technicality, overthrew it, and um, they lost it and didn't gain it back again until 1910, a long time. Ooh. So oh. there were big variations, big and, and also variations in the type of vote. Uh, uh, lots of states granted the right to vote for school boards, on school bonds, uh, sometimes for uh, municipal elections, especially if liquor was a hot topic and they wanted women's vote to create Carry. prohibition. Right. Uh, in some cases, they they gave the vote and took it away immediately afterwards. New Orleans, for example, granted uh, municipal suffrage for one, one election, election, 
they passed a sewer bond. New Orleans was a city of 300,000 people without any kind of public sanitation, no sewer system. Uh, they knew women no would vote for this. Then, I'm sure. <laughs> right? And it, it was serious because yeah, it is every serious, year they had hundreds, thousands mm -hmm. of deaths from mosquito-borne illnesses, mm -hmm. fly-borne illnesses that fed right. by the lack of sanitation. So they knew women would vote for this. They granted them the vote until the sewer bonds passed and then, and then took it. it away again. Well, you're, in some ways you're defining how men think of women, useful in some mm -hmm. respects, mm -hmm. and then they can mm -hmm. be manipulated back to mm -hmm. business yep. as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, if, you, if you came to, uh, if you say if you had to define men's attitude toward the position of women and the status of women and women's, is there a key difference? Women are much more likely to achieve what they achieve as an individual, uh, as a group effort. Mm -hmm. And men are more likely to want individual credit, whether or not they they achieved it all by themselves. But uh, <laughs> I I recently was the only woman on the the River Walk committee for choosing the uh, new statues that are yes. going to be on the river, and. Uh, the guys are very sweet, and they didn't have any problem with including two women uh, right. among the five. But I think if I hadn't been there, it might not have happened. And even for me, it was difficult. Um, I have to uh, confess, I don't, don't very, very hazy on the, the exactly, background of the second exactly. woman. Everybody is. Ah. Everybody is. The white woman, mm -hmm. uh, Eleanor Chamberlain, mm -hmm. was the president of the uh, Suffrage Association for Florida in the 1890s. She. Um, more than any other single person from this coast was responsible for women eventually getting the vote uh, after she was older and less active it, east coast women took it up including powerful women like the 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 wife of William Jennings Bryan and the wife of Governor Napoleon Broward and founder right. of Fort Lauderdale and, and that sort and of so thing. Forth, yeah. uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was a young woman then. Mm -hmm. But uh, Eleanor Chamberlain uh, went to the National Convention and was the the person, the person in Florida. In Florida. Um, well, you know what? We're going to have to take this conversation <laughs> to another show because good, good conversation goes like crazy. And, and we're, we're at the limits of this one. But I promise you'll come again another time and we'll talk a little bit more. There's right. so many things to talk about. Okay. Thanks so much oh, for yeah. coming. Thank and you. thank you for listening.